So I'm using last year's presentation because I haven't had time to modify it all because I have to get this done and then do another one before I can leave. It's Friday, it's after school, the bell just rang for the end of period seven. So you all get to have more writing up there, which I'm sure will thrill some of you. But this is dealing with defense responses. And it's going to deal with plants and animals. This is obviously being played on Monday. Hi, Mr. Ng. Hi, period. 5 TN. Sit down. So what we're going to attempt to do is, what's the role of self-signaling in defense responses? And I say defense responses just because defense actually means something very specific in the world of physiology, and it's different than the word immunity. Because to be immune means that there's actual recognition going on, and defense actually doesn't really have that much specificity happening. So just as a refresher for us, self-signaling turns out to require three steps. You should be able to recite these three steps in your sleep, but let's do it again anyway. You're going to have some type of signal, whatever that signal turns out to be. Hopefully it's a chemical, but it doesn't need to be a chemical. It's going to bind to some type of receptor. If the signal is something that can not or cannot enter into the cell, it cannot make it through the cell membrane, the receptor will be found on the cell membrane. If this signal is capable of entering into the cell, then the reception or the receptor is going to be found somewhere inside of the cell. The binding of the receptor with its signal molecule is going to set off a transduction cascade. A whole bunch of things are going to start to happen. You might start activating proteins through the use of kinases, either a tyrosine kinase or cyclic AMP or what have you. We're going to start adding a whole bunch of phosphates turning on all sorts of proteins. These proteins collectively are going to cause some type of response. If we have a some type of non-lipid soluble signal, odds are we're going to get some type of cellular response, meaning the cell is going to change its shape, or it's going to secrete something, or it's going to start to suck st stuff into the cell, something along those lines. If we have the receptor inside of the cell, because our signal molecule is fat-soluble, it is hydrophobic, it will bind, we'll get transduction pathway, it may or may not involve kinases, but what we're typically going to see is a genetic response, meaning we're going to start to change how we express genes. All that said, we have these two terms, immunity and defense. The big deal between the terms immunity and defense, immunity requires recognition. It requires a very specific identification in order to trigger the response, whereas defense doesn't necessarily care. It just works about anything or works for anything. Virtually all forms of defense will involve a cell in some way, shape, or form. The, the ways in which these things work are either very straightforward or they're insanely complicated. The cellular versions of things are pretty straightforward. The chemical versions are necessarily straightforward. The goal is not to become a walking talking expert in plant and animal defense or plant and animal immunity. There's just a whole bunch of variety out there. So either case, plants or animals, the first line of defense is the skin. Meaning, if you can't get into the organism, you can't cause it to get sick. So whether we're talking about skin of an animal or we're talking about the cuticle, which is the outer layering of a plant, both of those serve as first lines of defense. If you can't get in, you can't get sick, you can't get harmed. Seems easy enough as is. That's defense number one. Defense number two turns out to be if we're dealing with animals. Yay for getting... Yes, I am. Recording a video for the kids. They get to hear all this right now. They're like, wait, what's going on? Wait, what? That's all right. As long as there aren't any voices talking back. Usually not. Anyway, so you have another line of defense with animal cells that has nothing to do with skin. They're called macrophages. These are going to be cells that just go around. They just eat whatever's in their way. If it's a bad cell, they'll eat it. If it's a good cell, they'll eat it. They don't care. They'll just eat whatever's in their path. That's why it's a defense mechanism. It doesn't care. It will eat whatever is there. That process of going through phagocytosis, the actual consuming of other things, 
is actually a form of active transport, meaning we'll have some type of particle recognition, meaning it doesn't belong there. It'll actually cause an invagination of the cell membrane, which will then kind of wrap around whatever that foreign thing is. It's gonna be brought inside the cell. You'll have other cellular parts called lysosomes that will then merge with that vesicle brought in called the phagosome. They'll bind, lysosomes have digestive enzymes that'll get released and hopefully will destroy whatever was brought inside the cell. If there are any parts that are useful, the cell will take them. If they aren't, the, spell, the cell will export them out. So in a sense, this is exactly what you do when you eat. You open your mouth, you bring stuff in, you digest it, you get rid of stuff you don't need. There are other methods that plant or that animals turn out to use in terms of animal or defense mechanisms. One of those is referred to as complement. Complement is an SOS system whenever you get sick with a virus. So it's actually a mildly tragic system. So you happen to have this red cell here. It has a virus in it. It's sick. This isn't good. So the virus, what a virus does is it takes over the mechanics of the cell. It basically tells the cell, you're not going to do any of the stuff you want to do. Instead, you're just going to do what I'm telling you to do. So this cell here recognizes it's, it has a virus in it. It can't do anything to stop the fact that it has a virus in it. So what it does instead is it sends out little signals that are already made. The entrance of the virus triggers this cascade that causes the release of these chemicals by the name of interferon and what they do is they go and they warn other cells that by the way there's a virus out there build up your defenses now the cell that's sending out the signal this red cell it's done for it's gonna die from the virus it is sending out SOS's to warn others that a virus is coming prepare so it's actually a rather odd system that deals with forewarning. It doesn't know what the virus is, but it's warning nonetheless. Another animal response that turns out to exist would be a very fun one called inflammation. If you've ever stubbed your toe or gotten cut or something like that, you've seen an inflammation. There are several signs of an inflammation. We don't care to know the signs. If we were in physiology, you'd care to know the signs. What I notice is I have some type of skin damage. What that's going to do is cause the release of a chemical by the name of histamine. Histamine is actually going to cause blood vessels to swell up. They're going to get bigger. If they get bigger, more blood is going to flow to them, and more liquid is going to pour out of those blood vessels. It's going to be called swelling or an edema. So as liquid dumps out, it causes the site of the wound to swell up, because more blood is flowing through there, it's going to turn red and it's going to become hot. The chemical that gets released in part triggers pain receptors, and when you have pain, you don't want to move, which is probably good because you're injured. The chemicals, in part histamine, also attract phagocytes. So those are going to come to the wound site and start consuming anything and everything that's there. Whether it's good or bad, it's going to start eating everything. The result is, hopefully, if you were going to get infected, we're going to stop it real fast. Inflammation works for anything and everything. And it actually turns out to be necessary in order to heal if you do get hurt. One other nasty little chemical trick that we have is the concept of a fever. And a fever is just when your temperature is set higher than it should be. So right now you're at 37 degrees Celsius. But if you had a fever, your body is convinced that 37 degrees Celsius is actually the wrong temperature. Your temperature should actually be 40 degrees Celsius. So the result is going to be your body is going to think it's cold. What will that mean? You're going to start to shiver. You're going to turn pale. You're going to complain that you're really, really cold, even though someone feels your forehead and you're burning up. The reason is you're convinced your temperature is too low. So your temperature starts to jack higher and higher and higher. So you're sitting there and like, oh, it's so hot, it's so hot. If well, someone outside of you is going to sit there and take your temperature and say, holy cow, you're at 40 Celsius, this is too high, we need to take you to a doctor, this is bad. Or let's wrap you in blankets and hope that your fever breaks. 
once you hit that 40 degrees or whatever the new point turns out to be, one of the things that will happen is your body hopefully will say, oh, I hit it. Now I can go back to where I was. I can go back to 37 degrees Celsius. Once your fever breaks, once you hit that 30, you hit that temperature and your body is now ready to go back to where it was, you now have a lot of heat that you need to get rid of. So what's the result of after the fever? You are sweating all over the place. Your body is too warm. You need to get rid of the heat. You're going to get rid of the heat in the form of sweat. You're going to turn red. You're going to complain about how hot it is. You're not going to want to eat because it's too hot. You don't want to move because it's too hot. And basically, we've described you getting sick. What are you trying to do? You're trying to change the temperature so that we disrupt diffusion rates. If I can disrupt diffusion rates, I can end up manipulating the chemistry of the organisms inside of me, and that might make them not be so bad, which means my body has a chance to kill them off. Obviously, if this goes on too long, this is actually really not good because you're going to start to mess with your own rates of diffusion, and that is on the very bad side. But we have other things that we can do as animals because my favorite friend here, the platypus, it turns out to be poisonous. So we can bite, we can punch, we can run away, we can kick, we can stab you with pain, toxins. We can do all sorts of things. Plants are just as ingenious, if not more so. So plants, they'll have their first line of defense, meaning skin, but from there they start to change a little bit. They don't necessarily have phagocytes, but they have other things. Plants like warfare. They like chemical warfare. But before they get there, they booby trap you. So that's where thorns and thistles and trichomes and crypsis, meaning they look like they hide. So if you've ever seen like a stone plant, it looks like a rock. Plants will actually try and stab you. And usually the, the stabbing, especially if you have dealing with trichomes or thistles, they tend to go in and they don't tend to come out that easily. As in, it's, it's nasty stuff what these plants do to you. And it's all preventing you from getting at them in order to cause harm. Other things that plants will do is they're going to secrete poisons so that if you are dumb enough to eat one of them, it's probably going to kill you in some way, shape, or form. Among those things, this is a picture from Afghanistan. These are opium poppies. Opium is made to make heroin, but you also call that morphine. What is morphine? It's a painkiller. What does it do? It shuts off your brain. Cocaine, from which we get Novocaine, which you get at the dentist's office when you ever the dentist does something to your teeth, that's job is to overstimulate your nervous system to the point where it shuts down and the result is you die. The opium will kill you. The morphine will kill you. The novocaine will kill you. The, the nicotine in cigarettes is there to cause you harm. It is a brain stimulant. It is there to kill you. If you have caffeine because you like Starbucks, Caffeine's job is to kill you. Plants use chemical warfare, and they are so good at it, we don't even know everything plants can do to kill you, to prevent you from eating them. Fungi are actually even better at it, because they actually can hide and look like things that aren't harmful, but actually turn out to be, namely in terms of their chemicals. Some of the other things that plants will also do is they will release chemicals into the air. You just watched or listened to a lecture on Friday that told you about jasmonic acid. There it is right there. It actually turns out to be what we call a VOC or volatile organic compound. These are chemicals that can be released into the air that either mess with you or in some cases with plants, they attract other animals that might come and go after you, meaning if you're harming a plant, they might secrete a chemical into the air that attracts hornets. And the hornets are going to then attack whatever happens to have this chemical all over them. So plants are really good at chemistry. They are natural chemists. But they too have something very similar to the inflammatory response. 
Theirs is referred to as the hypersensitive response. And what happens here, it works against everything. So if you look at this, there's two sides. We're ignoring the right side for now because that's a very specific pathway. What we'll have on the left is any type of mechanical disturbance. Something is causing wound to this plant. Whether we recognize it or not, doesn't matter. Something is wounding the plant. What that's going to do is trigger a cell trans signal transduction pathway. Ripping open a cell will trigger a transduction pathway that will result in something that we call the hypersensitive response. What happens in the hypersensitive response is the plant is going to intentionally start to kill itself. The fancy word for killing yourself, cellular-wise, is called apoptosis. No, it's, it's not apoptosis, but it's apoptosis. So apoptosis. So with apoptosis, the cells themselves commit suicide. Why would they do that? They're, if they die, there's nothing for the organism to eat. So if we can sacrifice part of ourselves to save the whole organism, why not do that? Well, plants will also, that's why it's hypersensitive, because anything will trigger it to start to kill itself. It's why you pull plants out of the ground and they immediately start to wither away on you. It's in part they ran out of water, but it's also because they're killing themselves because they're convinced you're out to kill them. Other things that they'll do is they'll reap release jasmonic acid, and that will trigger defense mechanisms, including more of the hypersensitive response of the plant trying to kill itself. It also might send signals out to other plants to warn them, by the way, something bad is happening to me, run away, run away, or get ready because something's coming at you. There's all sorts of ways that plants and animals defend themselves thing that's in common with all of these mechanisms is it works for anything. These are not specific pathways. They are generic fights against something trying to cause harm to the plant or to the animal.